discover the latest performance numbers for both version 2 and 3 of SpaceX's Starship. Elon also spills some exciting details on when the first booster catch might happen. These calm days at Starbase might just be the calm before the storm. Even though the testing with S-29 and B-11 has tapered off recently, it doesn't mean that nothing is happening. SpaceX is still actively upgrading systems from the test site to the launch site in preparation for upcoming plans, starting with Flight 4. Elon Musk highlights significant milestones reached by the Starship teams and hints at the imminent Flight 4. Stay tuned to unravel the exciting developments shaping the future of space exploration. During the talk, Elon mentioned the recent milestones achieved by the Starship teams and the upcoming Flight 4, which should hopefully be around the corner. Elon expects this to happen in May, and the mission will be for the most part a lot like Flight 3, but there is a catch. Well, technically not an actual catch, but rather a virtual catch. Yes, for Flight 4, SpaceX wants the booster to go entirely through the boost back entry and up to the landing on the water, simulating a catch on the chopsticks. Not only that, but Elon said that if all of this goes well, there will be a catch attempt on the next flight. SpaceX also released the render of what this catch would look like if it were to be attempted, and well, let's say it looks quite scary. During Flight 3, we learn the booster is supposed to ignite all of its 13 inner engines at the start, and then shut down the ring of 10 engines to land on just the centermost three. We are not sure how reliable this animation is and whether to take it at heart or not but it doesn't show that transition from 13 to 3 engines. So we obviously have to take it with a pinch of salt. The animation shows the super heavy booster approaching at a high angle of attack and slowing down near, but not on top of the tower. After that, the booster flies itself in between the tower arms and lands on them. Saying it like that sounds simple, but don't be surprised if we see the first attempt going not so well. Unfortunately, Elon never talked about what actually happened with Flight 3 which means we don't really know how much work is left before Flight 4. But if all goes well with Flight 4, and it's indeed happening in May, that would mean its fifth flight could follow just a couple of months after that. So, plenty of summer vacations accordingly, because the first super heavy catch attempt could happen during these months. As for what will happen with the ship recovery, first up SpaceX will be trying to get the ship through re-entry. That's the goal for Flight 4. Elon said that the company wants to simulate at least two soft splashdowns in the water before trying it for real and landing back on the launch tower. That means SpaceX will need a few more tries, so a few more flights, and therefore Elon says he expects this to happen much more likely in 2025. My guess is probably next year is when we will be able to reuse Starship, but I think it's highly likely that this year we will bring Starship 2, or the ship, the ship side of it, to a controlled point in the ocean and have it basically land on a virtual tower in somewhere in the Pacific or the Indian Ocean. Either way, they have for a certain quite a few tries over the rest of 2024. I mean by cure and pace, SpaceX could perform like five more launches this year, so a lot of time to get this right? Okay now, let's look more into the future. Let's first go over the activities at the Massey test site. Right now, construction of the flame trench at the test stand systems is in full swing. Towards the end of last month, two sections of the water-cold manifold system were delivered to Starbase. And just at the start of this month, the final section joined them. With all sections now in sight, installation kicked off promptly. Last week, cranes were bustling with activity at the site. A sizable block, likely part of the flame bucket, was hoisted by a crane and carefully maneuvered into place beside the trench. With the flame holes already excavated, it seems this component is poised for integration into the main system in the near future. On April 13, a significant upgrade occurred at Massey, marked by the arrival of the new ship QD at the test stand. The ship QD typically represents one of the final components to be installed in systems, such as the launch tower. Its presence signifies that the construction of the flame trench system has reached its concluding phase. Moreover, the inclusion of ship QD indicates an innovative design approach seamlessly integrating elements from both the test stand and the launch tower. Alongside the flame diverter system, these advancements hold the promise of significantly enhancing efficiency in prototype testing compared to the current methods employed at the launch site. On April 16, progress with the system continued as two cranes were observed lifting additional parts to the designated area where the flame bucket was positioned a week prior. 
this rapid advancement in constructing the test system at Massey suggests that Flight 5 prototypes, namely the S-30 and B-12, may be among the first prototypes to undergo testing at this site. At the launch site, activities are bustling alongside the upgrades at the test site. Following B-11's return to the production site for the addition of remaining components, work at the launch pad commenced. Initially, on the 11th of April, clamps were removed from the OLM. Subsequently, the actuators on the chopstick were also dismantled for repair before being reinstalled. Notably, the front cover of the booster QD has been replaced, featuring a new design with a bulging top and a slightly tilted back. While the exact impact of this upgrade remains unclear, it's anticipated to enhance durability and shield the internal system from the intense heat and pressure generated by the 33 Raptor engines. Additionally, constraining arms were swapped out, followed by operations such as closing, opening, and extending the booster QD hood. SpaceX's attention to booster QD post-flight 4 is evident given the significant impact on this component. Following the flight, SpaceX replaced the damaged fuel pipes and the rear cover ahead of the B-11 static fire test. As a result, we anticipate further advancements at the launch pad for upcoming missions, particularly Flight 4 next month. Regarding launch schedules, SpaceX recently obtained a license from the FCC valid for six months, spanning from April 15 to October 15 of this year. The license specifies the purpose as launch vehicle communications for test flight mission launching from Starbase, Texas. Notably, it outlines activities for the first stage booster or super heavy to engage in soft landing maneuvers during this period. Musk's recent revelation confirms that in Flight 4, SpaceX will attempt a super heavy landing using a virtual tower, likely situated in the Gulf of Mexico. The objective is to achieve vertical landing control on the ocean surface, laying the groundwork for booster recovery with the Mechazilla arm in Flight 5. While the FCC license does not explicitly mention this, it suggests that this attempt may occur towards the end of the year. However, the license does hint at an imminent, super heavy virtual tower landing, possibly as soon as next month. Regarding the ship, the license does not include mention of it, indicating that it will continue to be splashed down as in previous flights. Musk's mentioned during a presentation at Starbase that they aim to successfully splash down the ship twice consecutively, before attempting to catch it with the Mechazilla arm. This suggests that both stages' recovery efforts will likely unfold next year. Meanwhile, Starship has undergone numerous iterations over the years from its early concepts like the Interplanetary Transport System, or ITS, to the Big Falcon rocket. But by the end of the last decade, Starship had essentially evolved into the version we see today. Compared to its earlier designs, Starship has undergone some fundamental changes. One notable change is the switch to stainless steel, a more durable and cost-effective material. Additionally, SpaceX eliminated the need for landing legs, deeming them unnecessary with the introduction of the orbital launch mount, as well as the launch tower. Instead, flaps or grip fins on the booster now assist in the landing process. Furthermore, SpaceX implemented a heat shield system to facilitate the re-entry process for the ship. It's a very interesting thought. In future missions, we might see some of these characteristics make a comeback in Starship. So what's the reasoning behind this? Let's hear what Elon has to say. So the moon obviously there's no Mechazola, so we need landing legs. And you don't need a heat shield and you don't need flaps because there's no atmosphere. Yep, those revelations are from the founder of SpaceX. All about the special Starship version, Starship HLS, which is pretty significant. Surprisingly, despite numerous proposed designs, we still don't have confirmation of the official design. What's intriguing is that the nose cone believed to be for the Starship HLS at the production site doesn't match any previous design. But let's set those aside for now and hone in on Elon Musk's revelations. In contrast to versions intended for orbital or Mars missions, lunar landing missions will require different designs to suit the lunar environment. Flying legs to Starship is quite understandable, as Elon Musk mentioned, there won't be a Mechazilla to catch Starship on the moon initially. Perhaps this system will be developed later when they establish a base on the moon, but it's certainly not feasible for the first missions. With a legged design, Starship will be able to stand firmly on the moon's surface, allowing the crew to descend from the crew compartment using an elevator system. In Starship HLS's designs, regardless of other changes, the legs are always retained. 
the variation lies in whether they are completely fixed or foldable. Next, the heat shields will be removed. This is because the moon lacks an atmosphere, meaning there is no need to withstand the intense heat experienced during re-entry on Earth. Musk has also reiterated that Starship HLS will be expendable, eliminating the necessity for a heat shield for its return to Earth, unlike the original prototypes. Estimates indicate that the entire heat shield's mass will be around 10% of Starship's dry mass, approximately 10 tons. By eliminating this mass, SpaceX can optimize the craft for other essential payloads or for accommodating the landing legs, as I previously mentioned. Furthermore, since there's no re-entry to Earth, complex flip maneuvers and flaps on the ship won't be necessary. Removing the flaps will help reduce weight and create space for SpaceX to install the landing legs. That's the design for the moon. So what about Mars? I believe the aforementioned upgrades can also be applied to missions on Mars, and the initial mission Starship won't have a landing system and won't be able to return. Mars does have an atmosphere, albeit extremely thin, only 1% of Earth's. Therefore, adapting the design used for Starship HLS would be feasible for Martian missions. However, I anticipate that SpaceX will still retain heat shields on Starship to ensure safe re-entry. Additionally, SpaceX intends to reuse and return to Earth in the Mars missions instead of adopting a completely expendable approach, like the Starship HLS, marking the use of a heat shield necessary. With the respective of any modifications, the methane and oxygen fuel on Starship will remain, optimizing the ability to produce fuel using available resources on Mars. This approach will not only save costs, but also lay the groundwork for further exploration into space in the future. Besides the designs that Elon Musk revealed, we can also imagine many other applications for Starship on Mars. For instance, during its initial landing, Starship could transform into a Mars base for astronauts to inhabit instead of constructing a traditional base. Alternatively, Starships could be designed to incorporate a gravity system called SPIN. As mentioned by Elon Musk in a tweet, Starship will have a small spin on the way to Mars, even a tiny gravity vector is better than none. According to this concept, two Starships would be joined together and rotated to generate centrifugal force, creating artificial gravity. This approach could help mitigate the effects of prolonged exposure to zero gravity on the human body, such as during the six-month journey to Mars. Although there have been no further developments on this idea from SpaceX and Elon Musk, as the journey to Mars draws nearer, they may need to consider implementing such a system. To implement this system, Starship would need to be larger to generate a strong enough centrifugal force. This is because a larger angular velocity radius would not require as fast spinning as a smaller one to achieve the same gravitational pull as on Earth. Starship being the largest rocket in the world is best suited for this purpose. SpaceX is even planning larger versions like version 2 and 3, which I will discuss right now. So, in addition to the special design changes, numerous other enhancements will significantly impact the Mars mission, with the most notable being the escalation in production and launch frequency, alongside the introduction of new versions. But why does this surge in production and launch frequency matter for Mars missions? Let's hear Elon Musk's perspective once more. Eventually, we will want to bring ships back, and I think we want to give people the option of coming back because they're more likely to want to go if there's some option of coming back. But I think most of the people that go to Mars will probably never come back to Earth. And we'll need to ramp production to pretty high numbers. Like I think ultimately probably a ship every multiple ships per day. Alongside the ramp up in numbers, the size of the Starship will undergo a boost as well. During the presentation, Elon Musk outlined the specifications for versions 2 and 3, in particular compared to the 121.3 meters of version 1. Starship 2 will soar to a height of 124.4 meters, and this will further expand to 150 meters in the third iteration. This expansion will not only create more room for passengers, payload and fuel, but also facilitate the integration of numerous features, such as the Starship spin system. Naturally, this design evolution will synergize closely with the substantial increase in the production of starships. And that's about it for today's episode. Thank you so much for tuning in and that's all for today's update. If you enjoyed watching and found it useful, please make sure to subscribe to my channel and hit the like button. And if you want to support our channel and if you want to be up to date, you can become an exclusive member. So click on our perks through the link in the description below. Thanks to watching and see you next time.